shower, or, or April showers bring May flowers, but what, is, what does the snow do this time of the year? Just curious. It's good to have all of you here, and uh, we're going to sing a song called I Am. So with the words are up here, and let's go ahead and stand and sing I Am. You come up front, too, if you like.
Lord, we thank you so much that you will never leave us, that you love us so much, you care about us so much. Lord, I pray now as we uh, have the service this morning, I pray for Pastor Joss as he brings the message to us, that you would just help him and give him the words to preach. And we just thank you for all the many things that you do and all the many blessings that you give unto us. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and turn around and say good morning and welcome each one here. Good morning and welcome to Jasper Bible Church. Um, glad to have each one of you here. If the ushers, when they get ready, come up and start with the Ministry of Friendship books, that would be great. Remember, Pastor and Lori is on vacation, and we have Josh for our message and for the soul food. Um, I'd like to start um, announcements this morning with Megan and Brandon. They have announcements for us. Good morning. I am Megan. This is Brandon. <laughs> we um, had an aha moment when Pastor gave a sermon a while ago now on um, the value of Christian friendships. And on the way home, we were talking like we usually do, and we were like, you know, we have a really great group of friends, but are we too old to make new friends? Like, <laughs> who decided at a certain age you're done making new friends? We don't go to school anymore. And so we thought the youth group. They're really cool, like we wanted to hang out with them, and they laughed in our face. Thanks, guys. So we thought we'd try young at heart, like they're really cool, we wanted to hang out with them. They gave us the same reaction. They didn't want to hang out with them. I'm still trying to figure out why they turned us away, the young at heart. I think we're pretty fun to be around. Um, our goal for this group is to uh, meet like once a month. Um, I'm thinking on a Friday for now, but that can change. Whatever works best. Uh, we're going to talk about God's intentions for marriage, parenting, uh, our careers, and just how should we, how should we be going about life? Because things are tough out there. We'll also be playing games and just having some free fellowship time and doing some different activities and just trying to find um, some good bonds and friendships with people who are in the same phase of life. So our first event is April 29th. There's more information in your bulletin, and we also have a Facebook group, so we'd like to see you there. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Megan and Brandon. A couple more announcements. Um, Friday at 6 p.m., grades 6 through 12 will leave the church for Toledo for a walleye hockey game. And also there's going to be a new members class um, April 10th at 2 p.m. Um, get with pastor on that. Um, the baptismal will also conclude the service on April 17th service. Um, ushers come up for um, offering if they'd like. Uh, and also what I'd like to make concerning Mina and Marilyn. Um, that will, she passed away, and that will be, um, the service will be at Wagley's and Adrian. Visitation will be Wednesday 2 to 4, and Wednesday 6 to 8, and the funeral will be at 11 a.m., and then after the um, service at the cemetery, there'll be a luncheon here at the church. Say it again, please. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your correction. Okay. Sounds wonderful. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the opportunity for Pastor and Lori to get away and enjoy their time also, and for Josh to be here. May you give him the words to say to each one of us. Um, think of the funeral coming up, that you would um, meet that need, and you would be honored. 
I would bring for your, before you all a request that each one of us have individual families and things going on always because we're in life. May you direct in those also. In Jesus' name, amen. I didn't announce it, that's why. <laughs> I was standing back this. I'm thinking, is, is that me? Am I supposed to be out there? <laughs> I forgive you, John. my feet they are walking on and sometimes the clouds are dark and low but I've got I've got to keep the faith and walk that straight and narrow way to reach the place that I will call my home My home is just around the bend I think about it now and then reunions by the millions everywhere But the one that I so long to see is the one bled and died for me, my home, my home, a place I long to be. So many call this old world their home, but I am just a stranger here through on a temporary stay and I'm looking forward to the time how in all of heaven it will be mine I watch and pray for it could be just any day and my home Now and then reunions by the millions everywhere. But the one that I so long to see is the one who bled and who died for me. My home, my home, the place I long to be. My home is just around the bend. I think about it now and then. Reunions by the millions everywhere. But the one that I so long to see is the one who bled and died for me. My a place I long to be. My home is just around the bend. I think about it now and then. My home, my home, a place I long to be. My home, my home. Place I long to be, for that's my home. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Judy, for special music this morning. Um, we are now going to sing a hymn. So if the praise team will come up and join me. <laughs> um, this is hymn number 208, Are You Washed in the Blood? So if you'd like to use your hymnal in front of you, or we have the words on the screen also. Um, and this is hymn number 208, Are You Washed in the Blood? So if you guys will all stand and join us as we sing. Jesus for the cleansing power Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's always really a pleasure to be back here for uh, Danielle and I and the kids. Uh, it's great. We live close enough they can be here at VBS and King's Kids, and uh, we can come up and do things like this. I was a little late uh, this morning. I think Danielle said on the way here people might be getting a little bit nervous. But if you remember, uh, I used to live across the parking lot. So now we have... Uh, about a 45-minute drive, so uh, actually it's not too bad. I was here about 10 minutes early. Uh, seven years I'm used to walking across the parking lot. Um, you know, I, I was thinking uh, over the past week, and I always loved Easter here at uh, Jasper, the sunrise service and uh, the breakfast and things like that. And I don't know about you, but uh, around Easter I like to spend uh, some special time, some extra time uh, reading the story. I don't want to miss Easter. I don't know if you've ever felt like that before, but uh, sometimes with everything going on, especially uh, if you have to travel, uh, Easter can almost become more of an event than what it was really intended to be. And so for some reason, I got thinking more about uh, the Apostle Peter, the life of Peter. Uh, Peter has always resonated with me. Uh, he's known as the, out of all the disciples, the one who uh, probably put his foot in his mouth the most. I, I don't consider myself somebody who is really outgoing and makes lavish promises like Peter did, but there are other reasons why I can really identify with Peter. Uh, I was thinking, uh, if I had known Peter, <clears throat> or if you had known the Apostle Peter, what we would have thought if he had made some of the promises to us and said some of the things to us that he said to Christ. And I'm thinking there, uh, 
near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, just shortly before he was crucified, you remember when they were in the upper room, Jesus was going around and washing the disciples' feet. And he came to Peter, and Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet too? And uh, Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing, but in essence, trust me, you know, you need for me to do this. Uh, because if I don't do it, you have no part with me. And in true Peter form, Peter says, well, in that case, don't just wash my feet, wash all of me. Uh, always outdoing the other disciples. I imagine a lot of times the disciples must have gotten annoyed with Peter's promises and Peter always outdoing himself. Of course, Jesus says, uh, explains to Peter, no, a man who's already had a bath needs only to wash his feet. In essence, saying, uh, you're saved, Peter, uh, but you do need your feet washed. You do at times need forgiveness. And then not even uh, that much later, uh, something similar happens again because Peter promises, Jesus is talking about uh, being handed over to be crucified, and Peter says, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And of course, uh, Jesus says, really, Peter, you know, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times that you even knew me. And then we're told in one of the Gospels that at that moment when Jesus is denied the third time by Peter, they actually make eye contact. And that's the last time, as far as we know, that Jesus and Peter saw each other before Jesus' crucifixion. And that's why uh, I'm really encouraged by a verse in Mark. And you don't need to turn there, uh, but it's in, at the very, very end of the book of Mark in chapter 16, because even though the book of Mark is the shortest gospel, Mark flies through the life and death of Christ. It goes so quickly, um, shares details that he wants us to know, but doesn't go into as much detail as the others. But in this case, he does share a detail that neither uh, Matthew nor Luke, the other synoptic gospels, neither of them share. And they both have this story, but they don't tell us this because we know that when Jesus was resurrected, an angel appeared and told the disciples that Jesus was not there and that he was going to meet them in Galilee, which is where they had spent most of their time together up in that kind of country, more out in the country region around the Sea of Galilee. And so the angel announces in Matthew and in Luke, Jesus has told you to meet, you disciples, to meet him in Galilee. But watch what Mark says. Verse 7, But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Now put yourself in Peter's shoes. You have promised more than any of the other disciples. You've been more vocal than any of the other disciples. And yet, in time of testing, you have proved the least trustworthy of the disciples, the most fickle. And in fact, in the moment of Jesus' deepest earthly need, denied him, denied even knowing him, cursed in the process, and then made eye contact. And then Jesus is mocked, beaten, crucified, and buried. It's a wonder that Peter is, doesn't share the same fate as Judas, really. And then Jesus tells the angel to announce, have the disciples and Peter. Because if you are Peter, you're thinking, when you hear, have the disciples meet me in Galilee, what's going to go through your mind? That can't mean me. There's no way Jesus could possibly mean me when he says his disciples. I'm sure he was questioning his status at this point. But notice that Jesus doesn't consult Peter. He doesn't wait for Peter to ask. He knows Peter's need, he knows the guilt that he feels, and he offers him forgiveness and reinstates him. That's grace. That's a word of grace. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of person that I want to follow. And the other thing that this tells me is that there isn't anything that you could have done, I don't think, that could trump Peter. Peter. I mean, you and I don't know Jesus face to face. We know him. We do know him. Uh, many of us here, at least, uh, know him uh, through faith in him. 
And yet Peter had spent several years with Jesus. He had walked with him. He had been the beneficiary of Jesus' ministry and then denied him. If you think that your sin, uh, your past is too much to be forgiven, there stands Peter as an example of the worst kind of betrayal of the Son of Man. And yet he's told, you too, Peter, meet me in Galilee. And we won't look there, but when we get to the book of John, Jesus offers kind of a rebuke, kind of a word of grace of forgiveness to Peter at the same time and reinstates him. But my thinking right now and my my thoughts are with you uh, who may not know Christ because your past, you think, is too much to be forgiven. And I'm thankful that the Bible doesn't let us go there, that we have far too many examples of people who have done far worse than you and I have done. And if you don't believe me, spend some time reading about the life of David uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Spend some time reading about the life of Manasseh in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Uh, And spend some time looking at the life of Peter and realize that you are not beyond the grace of Christ. And if you've never made that decision, I'd like to offer the opportunity to do that. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes. We do this here uh, and... um, allow you the chance to pray, and like Pastor says, and like I say, you know, there is no magic prayer, so it's not about um, saying, you know, a certain set of words, and yet it is about the opportunity to, uh, to place your faith in Christ, and in doing that in an appropriate way, and that's praying. And so if you'd like to do that, you can just pray these words to yourself after me. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that in my own way, like Peter, I have betrayed you. I believe that you died on the cross, that you were raised again for the forgiveness of my sin, and that I might live a new life in you. Please forgive me. Come into my life today. Heavenly Father, we know the truth is that um, we uh, thankfully don't have the opportunity to deny you to your face, and yet we can deny you with our words and actions in many different ways, and many of us here may have uh, at some point done, uh, done that. And so all of us need our feet washed quite often, just like Peter did. Uh, and there are others who uh, maybe even until this morning have been outside of faith in you because of things that they don't think a holy God would even want to deal with. And how sad that would be if people thought that way whole reason that you sent your son was to be a sacrifice for all sin. And I pray that uh, if anyone here has made that decision even this morning, that they would be able to uh, talk with us. We can encourage them and uh, rejoice with them about that. Um, And uh, we just thank you for all these things. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise team is going to come up and lead us in another song. sing another hymn, which is um, hymn number 272, The Solid Rock. And once again, we'll have the words on the screen. So if you'll stand and sing The Solid Rock with us.
Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah 35, if you would. Jeremiah 35. The pastor asked me to preach a little while back. You know, I don't know, sometimes it's difficult to know uh, how to go about choosing what to preach on, what to talk about. I mean, look at how big the Bible is. There's a lot of stuff here. You know, how do you choose something? And uh, so what I usually end up doing is preaching on something that God has been uh, hitting me with lately. And um, also, I like teaching on things that you may not, passages of scripture that you may not have heard before. And I like studying passages that I don't know anything about. I think that's the most interesting. Uh, And so hopefully, you know, we'll cover some new ground today. And uh, at the same time, I've found that when I'm aiming at something God has taught me, you know, a lot of times there are people going through similar things. So I'm kind of, I hit myself and I hit some other people too. And so I hope that's the case. And we're going to look at Jeremiah 35 and starting in verse 1, it says, uh, "The The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. Go to the house of the Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers and offer them wine to drink. So I took Jaazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, son of Habaziniah, and his brothers, and all his sons in the whole house of the Rechabites. I brought them to the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanah, the son of Igdaliah, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, above the chamber of Maaseah, the son of Shalom, keeper of the threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, Drink wine. But they answered, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, You shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house, you shall not sow seed, you shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. And we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us, to drink no wine all of our days, ourselves, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, and not to build houses to dwell in. We have no vineyard or field or seed, but we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and the army of the Syrians. And so we're living in Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words, declares the Lord? The command that Jonadab the son of Rechab gave to his sons to drink no wine has been kept, and they drink none to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and amend your deeds, and do not go after false gods and serve them, and then you should dwell in the land that I gave you and your fathers. But you did not incline your ear or listen to me. The sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have kept the command that their forefather gave them, but this people has not obeyed me. Therefore, says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'm bringing upon Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them and they have not listened. I have called to them and they have not answered. But at the house of the Rechabites, Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done all that I commanded you, therefore says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab, shall never lack a man to stand before me. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll talk about this for a few minutes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that this morning, as we look at the story of the Rechabites, that you would give us uh, wisdom and insight, that you would use your word to uh, pierce, uh, as it says, uh, and to lay bare the uh, state of our hearts, that we might be affected by your truth and walk in a way that pleases you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite stories is about Chippy the parakeet. And uh, some of you may have heard this, probably most of you haven't. And whenever I share about Chippy the parakeet, I, I read it because I don't want to get any detail off because it's just fantastic. 
Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. This is a true story. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage, and the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problem began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up and she barely said hello when Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, and turned off the vacuum and opened the bag. There was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom and turned on the faucet and held Chippy under the running water. Then realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hair dryer and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who'd initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. I was thinking about Chippy. Feels like just a few minutes ago, you know, I was graduating from college, excited about the next few steps in life, where that would uh, take me. A few 80 hour work weeks later, a few credit card debt payoffs, a few car accidents later, a few crazy but lovable kids later, and I can relate to Chippy. Still alive but stunned. You know? <laughs> Existence goes on, but the optimism, the optimistic song is over. You know, maybe you feel that way this morning. And uh, maybe you had those times or are in, in one of those times where you're kind of straining your eyes to, to see how does this resemble the life of world-changing faith that I expected, that I heard about in Sunday school. You know, how is this in keeping with the kind of faith I see in Scripture? And... You know, the view that I've noticed in myself and that a lot of us might have is that living out our faith must look dramatic. It must entail a lot of personal risk, the possibility of loss. It must lead to great stories that we can share, great testimonies, things that we can encourage people with. It's the thought that, you know, our our life of faith has to be marked by these sorts of externals. And I think it's especially difficult today because... We're surrounded 24-7 with news stories about things going on in the world. And in a sense, we have to keep aware of what's going on out there. But it's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? You look about what's taking place uh, in world and and national news. uh, It can really start to make somebody, I know, speaking for myself at least, start to make you feel small, start to make you feel like there's nothing you can really do to change the course of the way things uh, seem to be going out there in that it's futile to try. But I think it also stems sometimes from how different our life in America looks from the best, most interesting, it seems to us at least, Bible stories that we heard growing up. I remember flannel graphs. Do they still use flannel graph? I love the flannel. I hope that's still a thing. Um, but flannel graph, uh, Noah, you know, um, flannel graph David and Goliath, flannel graph, you know, the conquest of Canaan with Joshua or Paul on his missionary journeys. And so then we get to our week, and it's like, how is this anything like what I read in the Bible? And the truth is, the Bible is filled with numerous examples of the quieter kind of faith. It's all over the place on the page of Scripture. It doesn't seem to teach as well. It isn't as exciting for kids to hear, you know, I'm sure, and I understand that. Um, But my fear is that for those of us who hold this narrower understanding of what a life of faith is supposed to look like, that we can only have one of two uh, outcomes to that. Either one, that we're going to end up living with a sense of discontentment because we're not living up to our ideals. We have in our minds what it must look like. We're not living up to it, and so we become discontent. Or secondly, maybe even worse, you begin to believe that the world-changing ideas of faith that you had when you were younger will not be your story, and just settled in to become okay with that. 
either discontentment or disillusionment. I think we will end up going in one of those two directions if we have the narrow view of faith that I've alluded to. Our job now is to develop a more adult, biblical view of what living out our faith really looks like. And I have to admit, a lot of the time, it doesn't feel like I'm doing it right. You know, I get my kids out the door every morning to school. and Danielle helps me a ton, uh, but it does fall to me to get the teeth brushed, make sure the school stuff is around, get them in the car, drop them off. And, you know, I have to tell you, when I'm stepping in the milk, Jack has spilled, uh, rummaging around, uh, trying to find Gabby's show-and-tell thing, and getting upset because people aren't getting in the car and getting shoes tied, uh, and then getting to work finally and regretting how short I was with the kids, it doesn't feel heroic. And, you know, maybe you could fill your own examples in there of the things that you do each week or each month. But what if we're wrong? What if, these, what if this daily routine uh, is exactly the stuff that God uses to sanctify us? What if we don't have to break out into some exciting life, but realize that God is quietly working in us through even these things to make him into our image? What I mean is, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, he says, just as we told you. This morning, we're looking at one of those lesser-known examples. And by the way, this isn't about drinking wine. I know it looks like that. That's not the topic of this passage. It may, you may have gotten that impression. This is actually about a little bit different thing that we're going to see. And I think it's exactly what we need. I know it's exactly what I need. Just a bit of background, or else this passage won't make much sense. The northern kingdom of Israel, we're, we're dealing now in Jeremiah 35 with the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and so they were done. The story of Israel, the north, was over. Uh, they had disobeyed the prophets, they hadn't followed what they were told, and things ended for them. And so for a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, there was great opportunity to draw on that example and to say, see what happened up in Israel? They ignored their prophets. I'm a prophet. Don't ignore me. Judgment will be coming. Now, in the southern kingdom, something had happened in the reign of Josiah. He had, in the midst of having the temple cleaned, which hadn't been done in a very long time, they found a scroll. And we think the scroll was probably the book of Deuteronomy. And they brought the scroll to, to Josiah, and they said, look at this stuff that we didn't know about. You know, we all know. We all have Bibles, several Bibles in the house. We know, you know hopefully we're reading them. We know what that says. I mean, imagine the king of, of Judah didn't know about the book of Deuteronomy. Like, it's likely that that was the case. And so they read it, and, and they say, wow, we are way off. We've got a lot of work to do. And thankfully, we, under Josiah, they start to... Uh, do some reforms. They tear down the, some of the altars. They change their worship practices. And so for the people of Judah, they thought things were looking great. They thought they were on the right track. They were finally obeying God, and things were looking up, except for the fact that Jeremiah the prophet was on the scene saying, you are still going into captivity. In fact, he was standing outside the temple while people walked in, and he was saying, see this temple? Don't count on it. It will be destroyed. You will be leaving. You think Jeremiah was a popular guy? I mean, he seemed, must have seemed to the people like he was stuck in the past, like he was backwards, like he was a blast from the past. So here in Jeremiah 35, God provides Jeremiah with an amazing object lesson, which the prophets often do. Uh, he tells them to go call these people who had lived in the countryside to come right into the center of the city, into the temple, and to offer them wine to drink. And Jeremiah must have wondered what God was up to. And then they refuse the drink. And in fact, they don't just refuse the drink, they refuse, they, they explain that their commitment is to four things. They say, you shall not drink wine, we shall not build a house, we shall not plant seed, and we shall live in tents. 
This is one of the only high points in the entire book of Jeremiah. And God uses the Rechabites to say, look at the Rechabites. Judah, look at yourselves. You don't obey me. Look at the Rechabites. We have an entire community of people that were kind of like the Amish of Israel, right? Uh, They probably got some interesting looks. Their life may have seemed a little weird, but God calls out them, and he holds them up as an example, and he says, how come the Rechabites can obey the word of their earthly father, but you can't obey the word of your heavenly father? We're going to see three things about biblical faith today. Briefly, biblical faith is about listening and not just hearing. Biblical faith is about God and not about me. And biblical faith begins with declining the cup. It's about listening, not just hearing. It's about God and not me, and it begins with declining the cup. First of all, maybe you think I'm splitting hairs with this listening and not hearing. Um, Biblical faith is about listening and not just hearing. I think if you're a parent, you will relate to this. There is a difference, okay? There is a difference between listening and hearing. And what I mean is this. Uh, You know, maybe you've had that experience where uh, if you've had kids or you have kids, you've told them, for example, uh, you know, I might say, mommy is going to set the table. Come help mommy set the table. And you come back a couple minutes later, everybody is still playing with, you know, in the living room. And I will say something like, "Uh, kids, I asked you to come help mommy set the table. And they will say what? We didn't hear you. Now, what do you say to that? Are they responsible? They didn't hear it. Took me a little while to figure this one out, but you might want to write this down. This might be worth the cost of admission right here. I realized the response to this is, no, you did hear me. You didn't listen to me. Yes. You see, my vocal cords made the sounds. They vibrated. Went through the air. You know, the sounds hit your eardrums. The eardrums send like a message to your brain. (laughs) All that stuff happened. This is science, right? All of this happened. But the sounds hit your brain. You didn't listen to those sounds. In Hebrew, there's one word for hear, listen, obey. And it's probably, even people that don't know Hebrew know it. It's the word shema. Hear. As in hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is no difference between hearing the sounds and obeying the sounds in Hebrew thought. And it's the key to this passage because in verse 8, if you look back, it says, the Rechabites say what? We have shamad. We have heard the voice of Jonadab. They didn't just hear it. The verses tell us they didn't just hear the sounds. They obeyed it. Verse 15, God tells Jeremiah to tell the people, you did not Shema me. You did not hear me. The son of Jonadab, son of Rechab, uh, sons have kept uh, the command that their father gave them, but this people has not obeyed me. So the lesson is simple but powerful. Look at the Rechabites, then look at yourselves. You're not obeying, but it can be done. Somebody is doing it. Biblical faith is about hearing and not just listening. And how it looks is something like this, I think. It tells us in Psalms these words that maybe you've heard, taste and see that the Lord is good. You ever thought about that? Taste and see that the Lord is good? God is not a being that we just intellectually know a list of facts about. We are called not just to know information about God. We're called to experience him for ourselves. And how do you do that? Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, I love cheesecake. It's probably my favorite dessert. But if somebody offers me a cheesecake, do you think that I'm going to say, hmm, I know the maker of the cheesecake and that they're a good cook. I know from other people who have tried the cheesecake that it's very good. And furthermore, I love the coloring and the texture. It must be delicious cheesecake and walk away. But some of us are thinking about God in that way. We know information about him, but we're not tasting and seeing that he's good. How do you taste and see that the Lord is good? You obey. You put his words into practice. You hold your tongue when you want to lash out. You hold back your desires when there's something that you want to do but you know is displeasing to God. You conclude that it is better to give than to receive, and you give. 
Um, you decide, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and therefore I am not taking vengeance in this situation. You start to see for yourself, you start to taste for yourself. Like Paul uh, says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Tasting of the life of Christ. Biblical faith is about listening and obeying, not just hearing. And we're running out of time so quickly. Biblical faith is about God and not about me. Who is really glorified and honored with the Rechabites is their forefather, Jonadab. Think about how highly esteemed Jonadab must have been in the eyes of Jeremiah and others who heard about this, that this community of people is organizing their entire way of life around him. What a man he must have been. What a great uh, person of faith he must have been. You know, for a long time, uh, church in general has thought about salvation in terms of come to Christ because he can help you with your marriage. Come to Christ because he can help you with that addiction or he can help you raise your kids better. All of those things may be true, but ultimately, our call to faith in Christ is not simply about us. It's about God. Biblical faith is about God. It's not about me. And I'm thinking about verses like this. You know, well, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm thinking primarily about something like the prosperity gospel. Maybe you're familiar with that. The prosperity gospel says, come to Christ because uh, he, can, he wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have a lot of money. And in its worst form, it doesn't even say come to faith in Christ. It just says you don't need faith in Christ. You just need to activate your own potential which finds itself totally outside the biblical gospel. And I think about how does that kind of gospel fit in with these kinds of verses we read, where Christ says, take up your cross and follow me. The gospel is a death sentence, and you bear the indignity of carrying the own implement, your own implement of death. Count the cost before you jump in, Jesus says. He also says, blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Verses that say, let your shine, light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Or where Paul writes that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. I mean, where could we ever get the idea that in salvation, God's primary goal is to make me wealthy and healthy. It's simply not there. John Piper puts it this way, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. Notice he doesn't say when I'm most satisfied in my career or in my marriage. And the point, I think, is this. We only get the satisfaction that we're looking for when we stop simply looking for our own satisfaction and aim at something else, specifically God's glory. Biblical faith is about God and not about me. And finally, real quickly, biblical faith begins with declining the cup. Now, up to this point, probably you've, you've understood my, what I was going to get at before I even elaborated, but this one is probably a little bit different. Biblical faith begins with declining the cup because, of course, that's what the Rechabites do. They're offered wine uh, to drink, and they politely uh, decline. And so what do I mean by biblical faith begins with declining the cup? Well, in both the Old and New Testaments, God's judgment is pictured as a cup, something that's poured out in both Testaments. When Jesus prays in the garden, maybe you talked about this even the last few weeks, you know, with Easter being here, he says, let this cup pass from me, yet not what you will, but what not what I will, but what you will. He's choosing his words very carefully. Jesus knows what's in store. And he politely declines. But God pushes it back to him. Because ultimately, Christ is determined to do God's will. God says, no, you have to drink this cup. This cup represents my wrath. And this is what you're on earth to do. And the point is this. In order for the Rechabites to do their father's will, they had to decline the cup. In order for the Rechabites to do their father's will, they had to decline the cup. In order for Christ to do his father's will, 
they had, he had to drink it dry. He had to drink the cup of God's wrath dry. Jesus drained the cup of God's wrath so that we could become covenant keepers. And so now, when we are offered the cup of God's wrath, we, with the Rechabites, can decline. We, in fact, we can say there's nothing there. God's wrath is gone. It's been drained. It's been poured out on the cross, on the person of Jesus Christ. We can cry out to God in faith, I know the depth of my sin. I know that I deserve this cup of wrath. I deserve to have it poured out on me, but it's empty. There's nothing there. Because Christ took the cup, he did his Father's will, and on the cross, he absorbed every drop of it. And that's a reason to rejoice today. If you, like me, have uh, struggled and maybe looking ahead to another week, another seemingly mundane week of a life of faith, let me encourage you. Uh, with these things. Biblical faith is not just about hearing. It's about listening. Obey. What are some ways this week you need to do that? Start to taste of the Lord. Start to do some things that you know you need to be doing, experiencing. Maybe even it will involve suffering. Congratulations. Praise God for that. Paul says, I want to share in his sufferings. I want to experience that. Secondly, biblical faith is about God. It's not about me. That can suck joy away, can't it? When it becomes all about me. Make it about God. Biblical faith begins with declining the cup. If you're afraid the cup of God's wrath is still on you, recognize that has been poured out on the person of Jesus Christ. The journey starts in faith in him. Let me encourage you with those words this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Uh, for the example of your son. We thank you for this smaller example of the Rechabites uh, who followed faithfully. They weren't flashy. They weren't uh, a group of people that in our culture would have been uh, really noticed or thought of as uh, being important. And yet in the kingdom of heaven, these are the kinds of people who are game changers. And uh, they were content living um, you know, in a situation that uh, didn't allow them much fanfare and maybe didn't feel like a life of faith. I thank you that you saw fit through Jeremiah to show us this is the stuff of a biblical life of faith. May we obey you quietly if need be this week. May we experience you in our daily life. May we experience your presence as we apply your word to our lives. And may we rejoice in the fact that we too can decline the cup of your wrath. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise team is going to come up and lead us in a chorus. We are going to sing the song, You Are My All in All. And the words will be on the screen, so if you'll stand and sing with us, You Are My All in All. Not this one. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I did this during practice too, just so you know. I'm not learning. <laughs>
Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your grace and the mercy is upon us. Thank you for the message in Jeremiah that Pastor Josh gave to us. And help us to remember to, to listen and not just to hear, but to listen to your words that you speak to us as we re- read your word. And, and then to put you first, not ourselves, but you only, because you love us and you care about us. And we just need you each day in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you now for all that you do for us. I pray that you'd bless and watch over us as we leave here. Just give us a good day and a good week, and thank you for all that you do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are dismissed.